It is such an honor and a privilege to be here with you today um, to talk about something that is uh, very near and dear to my heart, uh, which is how we begin to use the science of adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress uh, to change the way that we respond to early adversity in childhood. So, uh, you know, just for starters, I'm going to say, how many folks have heard of the term adverse childhood experiences? A little show of hands. Okay, wonderful. Hopefully by the end of this conversation, we will all be experts. This journey really started for me um, a little over 10 years ago uh, when I finished my pediatrics training program at Stanford University. And I wanted to go and, and work in a place where I was needed. I wanted to be somewhere where I could make a difference. And so I went to work in one of San Francisco's poorest and most underserved neighborhoods, a place called Bayview Hunters Point. And uh, when I got there, I was seeing patients, and I noticed a very disturbing trend. A lot of folks in the community teachers and principals and people who work in after-school programs, they would send me patients and they would say, Dr. Burke, can you please take care of Bobby, right? Bobby, he can't pay attention in class. He gets upset really easily. He's hitting the kid next to him. Please, Dr. Burke, he's got attention deficit disorder. Can you please see him and put him on some medication, right? And I said, please, sure, come on, send him down. But when I actually did my job and I did a thorough history and physical exam, what I found was that for most of the kids that I was seeing, I couldn't make a diagnosis of attention deficit. It just, it seemed like there was something else going on. Somehow, I was missing something important. So I threw myself into the research and the science about how stress in childhood could affect the health of children. Because the thing that I was seeing, that history that I was hearing over and over and over again, was the story of children growing up in a violent neighborhood. Children witnessing domestic violence in their home. Children who, unfortunately, were dealing with parents who were addicted to substances or who were severely depressed or experiencing other types of mental illness. So when I threw myself into the science, you know, I was looking through all these research papers, and then one day my colleague walked into my office and he said, have you seen this? In his hand was a copy of a research study called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. That day changed my medical practice and ultimately my career. The Adverse Childhood Experiences Study is something that everyone should know about. It was done by the CDC, the U.S. Uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and Kaiser Permanente, a major hospital group uh, in the United States. And what they did was they asked 17,500 adults about their histories of 10 categories of adverse childhood experiences. These include physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, physical or emotional neglect, or growing up in a household where a parent was substance dependent, mentally ill, incarcerated, where there was parental separation or divorce, or domestic violence. For every yes, you get one point on your ACE score. 
And then what they did was that they correlated these ACE scores against health outcomes. What they found was absolutely striking. Two things. The first thing is that adverse childhood experiences are incredibly common. Just like what Ben found uh, when he talked about it here in Montenegro, the CDC and Kaiser, in their study, they found that almost two-thirds of adults had experienced at least one adverse childhood experience, and 12.6%, one in eight individuals, had experienced four or more adverse childhood experiences. Now, since this original study was done, almost 20 years ago now, in 1998, the U in the US, 32 states now collect data on adverse childhood experiences at the state level. And of those reporting their data, all of them report between half and two-thirds of the population with at least one adverse childhood experience and between 13 and 17 percent of the population with four or more adverse childhood experiences. Right? This is not isolated to one tiny community. In my home state of California, we looked at um, adverse childhood data across race and ethnicity, and we found that in California, it was almost equally pre pre prevalent. We found it in every race, every ethnicity, every income group, right? From, from the wealthiest to the poorest income group. The only thing uh, that we noticed in our income data was that for individuals who had four or more adverse childhood experiences, they were more likely to be living in poverty as compared to individuals who had zero adverse childhood experiences. So what we saw was that it was, uh, so the first thing that they found is that this is incredibly common and incredibly widespread. But the second thing that they found was even more striking. What they found was that there was a dose response relationship between adverse childhood experiences and health outcomes. Meaning the higher your adverse childhood experiences, the worse your health outcomes. For a person with four or more adverse childhood experiences, they were twice as likely to develop heart disease, the number one killer in the United States, and in fact globally, as a person with zero ACEs twice as likely. In the United States, having an adverse childhood experience a score of four or more is associated with dramatically increased risk for seven out of 10 of the leading causes of death. Globally, having an ACE score of four or more is associated with having dramatically increased risk of five out of 10 of the leading causes of death, right? So if you have an A score of four or more, your risk of heart disease is double, of stroke is two and a half times, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease almost four times, diabetes 1.6 times, Alzheimer's 4.2 times. In the US also added to that list of leading causes of death, we have cancer, having an A score of four or more, double the risk, of cancer and suicidality. Unfortunately, in the US, suicide is the 10th leading cause of early death, 10th uh, leading cause of death. And having an ACE score of four or more is associated with 12 times the risk of suicide. Now, we heard Ben talk earlier about the fact that um, the, the Overseas Development Agency estimated that 8% of our global GDP, right, $7 trillion annually, is lost because of the immediate and long-term impacts of adverse childhood experiences, uh, adverse experiences in childhood. But guess what, you guys? They did not calculate the cost of heart disease. 
They did not calculate the cost of cancer. They did not calculate the medical cost of treating chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, Alzheimer's, diabetes. I guarantee you that 8% of global GDP is a dramatic underestimate. And what we see is that without treatment, an individual with six or more adverse childhood experiences has a 20-year difference in life expectancy. When we say that adverse childhood experiences are a global health threat, this is not an over-exaggeration. This is not hyperbole. This is 20-year difference in life expectancy and dramatically increased risk for five out of 10 of the leading causes of death globally. Now, the original researchers, when they looked at this uh, science, right, they were trying to understand, okay, well, why does this happen, right? What, why is it that childhood adversity um, increases your risk of heart disease and cancer? So initially what they did was they said, okay, well, it's probably because you grow up in a rough household, right? You're exposed to terrible things, and you're more likely to, to drink and smoke and do all the things that are going to ruin your health. Right? You're exposed to bad behavior, and you repeat that bad behavior. And mm, they're partially right, right? So uh, what we see oops, is that individuals, I, the relationship between adverse childhood experiences and health-damaging behavior is, again, this dose-response relationship. The higher your ACEs, the more likely you are to smoke the more likely you are to become an alcoholic. And when we look at teen sexual behavior, right, you're more likely to engage in early intercourse. If you're more likely, if you're a girl, you're more likely to become pregnant. And if you're a boy, you're more likely to get someone pregnant, right? So when they, when they look at that, they say, okay, yeah, this makes sense. You're, you're more likely to engage in all these health damaging behaviors. And they drew this pyramid, right? It was on the website for the CDC, and it said, you know, adverse childhood experiences, social, emotional, and cognitive impairment, uh, increased health-damaging behavior leads to early disease and early death. But on the side of the pyramid, it had these little funny arrows. And on the arrows, it said scientific gaps, meaning we didn't understand what the mechanism was. And as a doctor, that's the place where I put my focus. Because when we understand the mechanism, right? When we understand not only which biological pathways are disrupted, but how, then we can use that science to target these pathways for prevention and treatment. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the biology of adversity, how early adversity gets under our skin. And I'm gonna talk about a couple medical things. It sounds, it'll sound a little bit, uh, you know, use some scientific terms. The terms themselves are not that important. The thing that's important is that we now, in the almost 20 years since the original study was done, we now understand the biology of how early adversity affects long-term health and development, and that can inform what we do about it. So the principal biologic pathway, right? The way this happens in the body is um, our stress response. It's called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the HPA axis, right? And this is the thing that's activated when we are faced with a mortal threat. So how does it work, right? Imagine you're walking in the forest and you see this guy, right? What happens? Immediately your brain sends a signal to your pituitary gland, which sends a signal to your adrenal glands, which sits right here on top of your kidneys. And it says, release stress hormones, 
right? So you release adrenaline and cortisol. And your heart starts to pound. Your pupils dilate. Your airways open up. Your body shunts blood, right, to all of your muscles and away from that teeny tiny muscle that holds your bladder closed, so you, you pee your pants, right? <laughs> and you are ready to either fight that bear or run from the bear. But if you were to think about it, fighting a bear would seem like a bad idea, right? And that is why your brain makes sure that you don't think about it. The part of your brain that's responsible for your fear and alert center, this is the amygdala, sends signals, right, to your prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain that's responsible for judgment, impulse control, cognitive function, and it turns it down, right? Because you don't want to think about it. It's not up to you. You're going to have to fight that bear. And instead, what your body does is it turns up the part of the brain that's responsible for getting you amped up and crazy, right? Imagine uh, uh, football fans after a football match, right? They're in the streets. They're like crazy people. That is the, uh, the locus ceruleus, the part of the brain that's responsible for making you act like a crazy person. Now, there's one other thing that happens in this stress response, or what we call the fight or flight response, that is a little bit less obvious. When you are getting ready to fight that bear, if that bear gets you, you know, look at him, he's big, he's got gigantic teeth, he's got claws, and if he gets you, right, you want your immune system to be primed, to bring inflammation, to stabilize that wound so that you can live long enough to either beat that bear or run away. So activation of the stress response also activates the immune response, right? And it leads to inflammation. That's pretty amazing. This is this profoundly ancient life saving mechanism that is fantastic if you're in, a, in the forest and there's a bear. But the problem is what happens when the bear comes home every night. And instead of being activated once in a long time, this system is activated over and over and over and over and over again. Children are especially sensitive to the repeated activation of the stress response because their brains and bodies are just developing. So high doses of adversity in childhood actually shapes the way that the brain develops. And it actually shapes not only the development of the brain, what we call brain architecture, it also affects the development of the immune system, our hormonal systems, and even the way our DNA is read and transcribed. So what we see as a result are changes in many systems of the body. As I mentioned, changes in our neurologic system, um, where your, your HPA axis, your stress response, becomes overactive. We see inhibition of the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain that's responsible for impulse control, right, and, and executive functioning. And uh, these were the exact same things that I was seeing in my patients. When people were sending me these kids and saying, please put them on medication, they've got attention deficit, they didn't have attention deficit. They had an over-exaggerated, chronically activated stress response. Now, I'm going to take a second here because on this slide, I have one little part that talks about the VTA, the ventral tegmental area of the nucleus accumbens. This is the part of the brain that's responsible for pleasure. It's our pleasure center. It's the thing that's activated by uh, 
sex and drugs and gambling and all the good stuff, right? <laughs> and this part is um, dopamine is, 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 the, is the chemical that's very active in this part of the brain. Well, it turns out that repeated activation of the stress response actually changes the function of dopamine in the reward center of the brain. And so people, and this is gonna sound weird, this is gonna sound counterintuitive, people get less pleasure from activities that should be pleasurable, right? And what happens when you get less pleasure? You need higher doses. You need higher and higher and higher doses of pleasurable activities to try to get the same feeling. And so as a result, the, when we saw before the dose-response relationship between adverse childhood experiences and smoking, alcoholism, sexual behavior, there is actually a neurological explanation for that as well, right? So these changes in the brain and body are really profound in terms of uh, the way that they affect uh, long-term health and development. We also see long-term changes in the immune system, and these can be measured in adults who experience maltreatment as kids. We see uh, changes in the hormonal systems. Again, these changes can be measured into adulthood, changes in the cardiovascular system. And then the last thing I'm just gonna take a second uh, to talk about is uh, changes in uh, our epigenetic regulation, changes in the way our DNA is read and transcribed. Right? Because as we're talking about all of these things, right, you, you have to ask the question, okay, I get it. I see how experiences in childhood, how it activates your stress response and why kids may be having trouble uh, in class. But how does it lead to cancer 40 years later? Right? So it turns out that, um, you know, we, we ask this question, which is more important, nurture or nature? Genes or environment? And I think we can think we say that science has put that question to rest. It is absolutely both. Our genes, our genetic code, provides us with um, kind of the, the basic information. And then our environment determines which part of our genes are turned on or off. Exposure to adversity marks our genetics. It, it leads to what we call epigenetic markers that tells our body to continue to transcribe the parts of our DNA that help us to be more reactive to stress, right? So it turns up all of the things that I um, just talked about and it does it, uh, it changes our uh, genetic programming in a way that is long-term, right? And this is how early adversity gets under our skin and lasts a lifetime. The one other thing I wanna add about our uh, epigenetic regulation is that there's this funny thing called telomeres. Telomeres are like the, um, the bumpers on the ends of your DNA, right? Um, and they protect our DNA against wear and tear. High doses of adversity leads to erosion of our telomeres. It wears down our telomeres. And when our telomeres get too short, then our cells don't, uh, they stop replicating normally, right? The, the, the cells they, we see premature aging in our cells, and we see uh, changes in the way our cells replicate. And what that means is that if a cell gets old too fast and forgets to do what it's supposed to do, if it's a cell in the pancreas, for example, and it's supposed to make insulin, premature aging means that that cell will stop making insulin, and then you end up with diabetes, right? So this is how early adversity directly leads to long-term adverse 
health outcomes. And this is what the um, American Academy of Pediatrics now calls toxic stress. Now, I want to just take a pause here, because that's a lot of science. And, you know, you all may be thinking to yourself, what the heck is this woman saying? Is she saying that, that kids can't be exposed to any type of stress at all? We've got to take our kids and put them in a bubble? <laughs> Absolutely not. Right? The term toxic stress refers to our biology. It refers to the way that our, um, it refers to the long-term changes in our brain and our organ systems as a result of high doses of adversity that are not buffered by a stable caregiver. Right? But what we know is that stress happens in life. Right? Bad things happen. However, what the science is showing us is that, as humans, we have a profound ability to be a biological buffer to each other's stress response. Right? My baby is one year old. Okay? And uh, I don't know if there are any mothers in the audience, but I know that uh, when my baby cry, when my baby cries, I'm just weaning right now, so, <laughs> but when, I, when my baby cries, right, um, it leads to, um, my, my breast milk lets down, right? That is a biological signal from my child that leads to a biological change in me, right? What we know is that when kids are exposed to high doses of adversity, if they have a safe stable and nurturing relationship with a caregiver, that caregiver can biologically buffer the child's stress response. And so that is really critically important to understand. So what does this mean? So for me, what this meant was, I, uh, the first thing I did when I understood the science, when I read all these papers, was I came back to understand how much of a problem this was for my patients. And we actually did, um, we went through all of the charts of all of the patients that we had seen in the first two years. And based on the information in their medical record, we assigned each patient an adverse childhood experiences score. Unfortunately, what we found was very similar to what Kaiser and the CDC had found in their study. 67% of our patients had at least one adverse childhood experience, and 12% of our patients had four or more adverse childhood experiences. Now, the big difference between our study and their study was that they, uh, at the CDC, they asked adults, which of these happened to you before you were age 18? And in our study, our average age was eight years old, right? So these kids still had time to go uh, in terms of accumulating ACEs. But what we found was that for our patients who had four or more adverse childhood experiences, they were twice as likely to be overweight or obese and 32 times as likely to have learning and behavior problems in school, right? So this is our kids with zero adverse childhood experiences. And uh, on the far side here, so it's zero, one to three, and then four or more adverse childhood experiences. Here we see the same dose-response relationship. But for our kids with zero adverse childhood experiences, only three of them had learning and behavior problems. But for our kids with four or more adverse childhood experiences, 51.2%, more than half, had learning and behavior problems in school, right? So we understand that ACEs dramatically impact not only health, but also education. In the US, there are 34.8 uh, million children that are reported to be uh, impacted by adverse childhood experiences. That is what's reported. Right? So when we talk about the scope of the problem, this is really 
a profound crisis. But the good news is that all of the science tells us that early intervention, right, can mitigate the impact of ACEs, right? We recognize that if we do early detection and effective intervention, we can actually improve uh, many of the outcomes that we're talking about, and you'll hear a little bit more about how we do that from Dr. Gardner later today. Um, so what we did in San Francisco was we created, I started my organization, the Center for Youth Wellness, to prevent, screen, and heal the impacts of adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress. Prevention is focused on scaling up programs and policies that prevent ACEs to begin with and mitigate the effects of toxic stress and raise national awareness of adverse childhood experiences as a public health threat. Screening. Screening, I think, is really, really critically important. You all will remember that these patients were being referred to me by, by teachers and principals and folks in the community because they were experiencing such severe symptoms that they could no longer sit in the classroom, right? We must not wait until children are exhibiting such severe symptoms for us to do anything or intervene. We must do routine screening that will allow us to do early intervention. And the key to early intervention, what early intervention allows us to do, right? <laughs> is that children's brains and bodies, remember, we, we talked about the fact that children's brains are rapidly developing. So when we do early intervention, we have the opportunity to take advantage of that brain development, take advantage of that neuroplasticity, right? To allow, to intervene and allow the child to begin to grow in, an, in a healthy environment as opposed to an unhealthy environment, and children will respond because they have this wonderfully rapid brain development going ahead of them. And we also have to support children uh, who are experiencing toxic stress with the effective and most promising preventions to prevent long-term health outcomes. But ACEs continue to be a public health crisis that is hidden in plain sight, right? This issue is being viewed oftentimes, so first of all, what we know is oftentimes it's not even being talked about, right? Um, and even when it is talked about, the evidence of the widespread prevalence of ACEs is often ignored. And particularly in the media, this is framed as a poverty issue or a socioeconomic issue instead of rightfully recognizing that this is an issue that affects all communities. Now, most often, when it is talked about, the linkage stops with a discussion of mental and behavioral outcomes. And I think that's actually part of what adds to the stigma of this issue, uh, because there's so much stigma around uh, mental health outcomes or uh, substance abuse or addiction. Um, and yet, folks aren't talking about the risk of asthma, the risk of diabetes, the risk of heart disease, right? And that is critically important. When physical health is talked about, often the discussion is limited to the biology of the brain and cognitive development, but very few are talking about the linkage to chronic illness and life course health. So the World Health Organization weighed in on this, and they said, viewed through the public health lens, adverse childhood experiences are widely prevalent, highly interrelated, and intergenerational. Many conditions that public health seeks to prevent as if they were a primary problem are actually seen to be the diverse outcomes or symptoms of a common set of underlying determinants. Consequently, ACEs themselves are the primary problem. And for a truly preventive upstream approach, public health and social development policies and programs need to be explicitly aimed at ACE reduction. 
So how are we going to do this? Right. We need a movement. When we talk about what it's going to take to address adverse childhood experiences as a public health crisis, the first thing that we need to do is raise global awareness. We need to start talking openly about the problem in, in culture-specific uh, ways, regional and culture-specific ways, but we need to be shouting it from the rooftops. The second thing uh, we need is early detection and intervention requires routine screening, right? We can do early detection and intervention, but first we have to do routine screening. And in our center, we advocate for routine screening to happen at the pediatrician's office or at the family doctor's office. And the reason that we say that routine screening should happen in that place, um, the screening itself, is that um, um, uh, in the US, I'm, I'm not uh, certain how it is in Montenegro, but in the US, information that is disclosed in a doctor's visit has certain legal protections. Right? So folks don't have to worry about this information being used against them. They can speak openly to their doctor about the issue. And the second thing is that a, a doctor has a, has a legal obligation to act on these findings. Right? So we have an obligation to at least um, uh, counsel and advise our patients to the best of what the current medical practice uh, ha uh, advises us to do. Um, and once it is identified, right, even though the screening, we advocate for the screening to happen in the doctor's office, we recognize that the current best, we know that the current best practices, like when we think about what do we do about it, we know current best practices include home visiting, mental health treatment, social work treatment, and two generation interventions. And what I mean by two generation interventions is that when we talk about the biology of toxic stress, when we talk about the increased risk of heart disease and cancer and stroke, we recognize that for many people who have their own history of adversity in childhood, right, when they're raising their own children and they're faced with an extremely stressful situation, they themselves may have an inhibited prefrontal cortex they themselves may have impaired impulse control. They themselves may have an overactive locus ceruleus, so they may get a little bit extra amped up. Their stress response may be releasing higher levels of adrenaline, right? So you have to, in order for an adult to be the supportive buffer to a stressful experience as a child, they themselves need to be well-regulated, right? So we have to not only help to reduce the dose of adversity for the child, but we also have to support the adult to help them be the appropriate buffer uh, for the child. And, and finally, we need to advance the science, right? So we know uh, all the stuff that I've told you is about, is the science that has, uh, we've developed over the last 20 years but we know that we still have further to go in c more precisely understanding the science of how do we biologically prevent chronic disease uh, later on down the road. So the good news is that the awareness raising is happening already in certain places. So uh, what's really exciting, these two graphs, uh, the first graph represents the number of scientific research papers that are looking at the link between adverse childhood experiences and health outcomes, right? That is profound. As we can see, there's been an exponential increase over the past 15 years. Uh, in addition, this graph looks at uh, the number of news articles talking about adverse childhood experiences in the media. And this was in the US. And uh, what we see is a seven-fold increase uh, between 2011 and 2015, just in the last four years, uh, five years, in the number of news articles about adverse childhood experiences. So we are sounding the alarm. And uh, we see this work 
uh, being covered in places like the Washington Post. I was very uh, honored to give a presentation uh, on adverse childhood experiences in the White House last year. And I encourage all of you to uh, check out a film that was made by uh, Jamie Redford, Robert Redford's son, about uh, adverse childhood experiences and the biology of stress and the science of hope. It's an excellent film called Resilience. But as we are going about the process of raising awareness, we also have to be pushing practice forward, right? We also have to be changing the standard of care. And our center has developed a screening tool for doctors to be able to screen for adverse childhood experiences as part of the regular uh, physical. And it's pretty, our protocol is pretty simple. It's screen, counsel, and refer. You don't have to have a, a, a therapist uh, or a social worker in your office, but you do have to identify, right? Counsel the patient about the biology of adversity and what the process that's going on in their body, and then refer them to someone who can help to uh, do the intervention, which, as I said, is to reduce the dose of adversity for the child and enhance the ability of the caregiver to be a buffer. The reason this is so important is because the research shows, right, this is a particular study looking at a multi-site study at children exposed to or at risk of maltreatment. And it was found that by age six, on average, these kids had an ACE score, an average ACE score of 1.94. Between ages of six and 12, on average, they accumulated an additional 1.53 ACEs. And then between the ages of 12 and 16, they accumulated an additional 1.15 ACEs, right? That is the reason why we need routine screening for early detection. In our center, we have a very simple, I'm just giving an example, a very simple screening tool where parents don't actually have to sit there and tell the doctor, you know, my child was sexually abused, I, you know, we experienced this and that. You, you don't have to say which adverse childhood experiences your child has experienced, only how many. So we have parents read um, this questionnaire and then they put a number in the box. And once, if that number in the box is anything more than zero, right? Um, what we do is as doctors, we ask about symptoms. Is your child having any problems sleeping? Are they having any, uh, did they gain or lose any weight? Are they having problems with bedwetting or losing their hair? Or um, uh, are they having uh, difficulty, poor control of diseases like asthma or diabetes? Or unexplained pains like headache or abdominal pain? And if the patient is having any symptoms, then what we do is we recommend uh, our um, protocol, which is to, to counsel and refer. Make sure, because once you know that the child has not only experienced adverse childhood experiences, right, but now they're experiencing symptoms, that means that their brain and body, right, is sufficiently disrupted that uh, we have to act. And that is when we plug uh, families into services. And we actually, in our protocol, we made this, uh, we put this together in a protocol and made it available for free on our website. And in our protocol, we actually gave a script for doctors to be able to say. So one of the things that we say is, you know, we now understand that exposure to stressful or traumatic experiences, like the ones listed here, may increase the amount of stress hormones that your child's body makes and this can increase their risk for health and developmental problems like asthma and learning difficulties. Because of what your child has experienced, I'm concerned that this may be contributing to her problems in school, her worsening asthma, her weight gain, and I'd like to refer you to someone who can help. And we also include in our script a little counseling for the caregiver. We also know that a healthy caregiver is one of the most important ingredients for healthy children. 
So the same applies to you, whether it's mom or dad, grandma or auntie. Reducing or managing your stress level is one of the best things that you can do for your child to improve his or her health and development. So our team went through and looked at something like 20,000 research articles. And we boiled it down into which are the most effective interventions, and essentially to help to regulate the stress response. And it, essentially, they fall into six things. Sleep, exercise, nutrition, mindfulness, ment like meditation, mental health, and healthy relationships. Six things. Sleep, exercise, nutrition, mindfulness, mental health, and healthy relationships. And those, um, they sound pretty simple. We all know that they're, they're much easier to say than to do. But what we know about these six things is that these things help to reduce stress hormones, reduce inflammation, and enhance neuroplasticity, right? Which is the ability for the brain to, sh to shape and remodel itself. So these things reduce, uh, reduce stress hormones, reduce inflammation, and enhance neuroplasticity. And that is essentially the treatment uh, for toxic stress. And we made all of these uh, things available in our user guide for health professionals. Um, we made it available in 2015, and we're really excited that this has been downloaded in more than 23 countries around the world. We're also creating a community of practice. In the US, we are enrolling 1,000 pediatricians, 1,000 doctors, to screen 300,000 children for adverse childhood experiences. And our goal here is to create a community of practice, for us to learn from each other about what works and what doesn't, how easy or difficult it is for us to move to large-scale screening for adverse childhood experiences as part of a regular physical exam. When we are, as a doctor, when I see a patient, right, and I, I check their height, I check their weight, I listen to their heart, I give them their vaccines, but I'll tell you, I, you know, in my practice, I haven't treated a single case of tetanus, right? I give the tetanus vaccine every single day. And I've only treated one case of tetanus, and that was when I went down to Haiti after the earthquake, right? When we talk about the, the prevalence, the number of children that are being impacted by adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress, I, I believe that there can almost be no more important screening or assessment than we can do in the doctor's office than to screen children for early adversity. We're also working on advancing the science. We're currently doing a large-scale randomized controlled trial in partnership with uh, UCSF, which is a, a major research hospital in San Francisco. And what we're looking at is uh, the association between adverse childhood experiences and biological markers that can be measured in the blood that predict risk of things like heart disease and cancer. So that's something for the future. It'll take a little bit of time, but we're very excited to be advancing the, uh, the research in that, work, in that way. We know that in order to be successful in building this public health campaign, in order for us to move this work forward, right, we all have to be part of the solution. In the US, when we were looking at dealing with very high levels of lead poisoning, right? The medical community knew how to give medications to uh, remove lead from the blood of children that were experiencing lead poisoning. But that wasn't the solution. It was one small part of the solution. The rest of the solution meant that we had to take lead out of paint. We had to take lead out of our pipes. We had to remove the environmental sources of lead. And that was what led to the public health impact that we've seen. Currently, we need to remove the environmental sources of adversity 
for children, even if we develop these scientific advances, there needs to be a change in every segment of society in the way that we interact with children who are exposed to high doses of adversity. Uh, in, in California, our organization has been very active in convening groups from all different sectors to figure out how we can think about changing our policies and practices in the classroom, in the juvenile justice system, in our early childhood system, and in healthcare. And we have convened a group called the California Campaign to Combat Childhood Adversity. This is a group of organizations, including the Department of Justice, the Department of Public Health, the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, the Children's Defense Fund, research institutions, clinics, and educational institutions that are all coming together to think about how do we create an ecosystem of support for children who are exposed to early adversity. Preventing ACEs and ending violence against children go hand in hand. And our goals, uh, as we've seen, this work, I'm incredibly excited to hear that Montenegro has signed on to be part of the campaign to end violence against children. Because in this work, what we see is that we must build public and political will in order to be successful. We must accelerate action and we must strengthen collaboration. The way that we do that is very concrete. As I mentioned, number one, raise public awareness. Number two, promote early identification coupled with referrals for interventions. Number three, increase access to interventions. Number four, training our workforce to be trauma-informed to learn how to recognize that that child's symptoms are, is not actually ADHD, right? It's not actually attention deficit, but that child is demonstrating signs and symptoms that they are being exposed to high doses of adversity. Um, we also must partner in efforts to address the determinants of adverse childhood experiences, including looking at policies, practices, and programs that help to treat the root causes of childhood adversity, particularly in communities that experience adversity more severely and more profoundly. Uh, and we must cultivate trauma-informed systems and track our data and outcomes. I'm gonna say that last one again because it's so important. We must track our data and outcomes. Uh, as part of my um, information, I'm just leaving some resources for folks, anyone who's interested, uh, including where you can download um, uh, our resources for physicians. If folks are looking for uh, ACE resources for home visitors, for mental health practitioners, for folks working with mothers and young children, all of these are part of, uh, there are resources for all of these available online. I want to uh, close by uh, telling a story of a patient that I saw a little while ago in clinic. I saw a um, two and a half year old girl who came in to see me. The first time I saw her actually, I saw her brother and he had been uh, hospitalized uh, for a pneumonia and I saw him after he was discharged from the hospital for a follow up visit. And I learned that these, uh, this family was new in town. And so I said, okay, why don't you come back and I'll do the regular physical exam. So they came back uh, a few weeks later. And the first time I saw them, I saw both parents there with the brother. And they were absolutely adorable. They were the cutest family you've ever seen. And as I walked out of the exam room, you know, I had this wonderful feeling like, wow. What a beautiful family. Little, gorgeous, blonde-haired boy, blue eyes, adorable. Uh, and the family was so lovely. Uh, when they came back two weeks later, uh, mom came. It was just mom, which is uh, not uncommon. And she came with her daughter, uh, who was two and a half years old for, their, uh, for her physical. And at that physical, 
the mom said to me, I asked her if she had any concerns, and she said her only concern was that her daughter was small. She, um, this was a little girl who, when she was born, she was at the 25th percentile for her height and weight. And over the course of her first year, she drifted down uh, until she was at the very bottom of the growth curve. When I measured her, she was at the one percentile for height and weight. So I asked about nutrition, I asked about her diet, I asked um, about uh, any family history of heart disease. I examined her very closely, I listened to her chest. I asked about uh, you know, whether there was problem, possible that there was any possibility of kidney disease. Because there are all kinds of things that can cause a child to fail to grow. It's called failure to thrive, that's the medical diagnosis. And as I was flipping through my paperwork, I came across the adverse childhood experiences screen that mom had filled out for her daughter. And on it, she said that her daughter had an adverse childhood experiences score of seven. Now, initially, I thought mom had made a mistake. I thought that she had accidentally filled out her own A score instead of her daughter's. And so when I went through and I asked her about it, and I said, you know, we, we do this to understand the child's exposure to early adversity because it can affect their health and development. And I thought mom would correct herself, but instead, I saw that she was nodding her head. And I said to her, um, you know, I'm actually, I'm concerned that maybe your daughter's problem growing may actually not be a nutritional problem, it may be a stress problem. And when I said that to mom, again, she nodded her head. And I said, have you heard of adverse childhood experiences before? And she said, no. But when I read your questionnaire, when I filled out your form, it made perfect sense to me. Because her dad has had a lot of problems. And there's been a lot of stress in our house. And when her dad is away, it seems like she eats better and, and picks up weight a little bit. But when her dad comes back into the home, it seems like she just goes backwards. And this is a family that had been cared for, uh, like I said, they had recently moved by another pediatrician across the country. And I, and I asked her, I said, did you ever ask your previous doctor, did you ever tell your previous doctor about this? And she said to me, no, he never asked. He never asked, right? I'm pleased to tell you that this family, when I explained to mom what could possibly be going on and referred them to services, within three months, that girl was back on the growth curve, right? This is the difference that routine screening and understanding the science of adversity makes. Everyone, everyone in this room is no more than one degree of separation from someone who has experienced ACEs. This is not about those people. This is about us. This is about our children, our nieces, our nephews, this is about our grandchildren. Today, I invite every single person in this room to be part of the revolution in how our society understands and responds to adverse childhood experiences and, and violence against children. If every person in this room here today leaves here and does one thing that is within your power to raise awareness or advance a response around ACEs, that is where a global movement begins. Thank you.